Okay, uh, welcome everybody to uh, this uh, afternoon session on equilibrium statistical mechanics. Um, uh, it's, uh, uh, so to th this afternoon we have three talks uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce the, the first speaker uh, who is uh, Sabine Janssen. Uh, uh, will I see Sabine? Or, or Okay, welcome Sabine, even I, if I, ah, hello. I see you. <laughs> uh, welcome, and uh, let me also show this uh, nice medal that as an invited speaker, you will uh, receive uh, at home in the, in the next days. And um, so Sabine, um, uh, so le le let me introduce her. She received her PhD in, uh, uh, in Berlin in 2007 uh, um, uh, with uh, Rudy Seiler. And then um, um, she traveled as a postdoc in several uh, um, uh, institutions uh, um, in uh, Europe and the United States. She, she, um, uh, she was uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, uh, then in Princeton, uh, at the Weinstrass Institute in Berlin, uh, at the Ausdorf, Ausdorf Center in, for Mathematics in Bonn, uh, then in Leiden. Then uh, she became junior professor in Bochum, lecturer in Sussex, in Sussex, and now she's professor of mathematics uh, at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. Uh, Sabine contributed uh, to uh, several important problems uh, in uh, uh, quantum and classical statistical mechanics, mainly uh, equilibrium statistical mechanics. Uh, she uh, studied problems uh, um, for Coulomb systems in low dimensions, in particular connected with the um, uh, Laughlin states in one dimensional or quasi one dimensional systems, uh, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, the problem of uh, crystallization in Coulomb systems. Um, uh, she uh, contributed a lot to, to the um, theory of uh, um, equilibrium gives measures uh, uh, by developing uh, and extending uh, uh, methods of uh, virial and cluster expansion, in particular for uh, multi-species uh, systems, uh, which are of great importance for the problem of uh, um, uh, phase transitions in uh, um, classical and quantum systems uh, uh, with uh, hardcore interactions. And uh, today, um, uh, she will, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, present uh, uh, she will talk about uh, multi-species cluster expansion and density functionals, and uh, please. Uh, we are. Thank you very much for the, for the invitation and for the kind introduction. It's really an honor to speak um, at the conference, even though I am not physically present there. So as Alessandro just said, what I'm going to speak about today is uh, multi-species virial expansions and some connections with density functions. And before I say vague things, let me go right away and try to give you an idea of what kind of systems I want you to think about. It is essentially systems of three types even though mathematically speaking, this will all be one and the same. The first is, if you like, point-like particles that are characterized just by coordinates, which are elements of Rd, or everything that I will do will be in finite volume, so there will be a cubic box zero L to the D. And then there will be some pair potential, which can be attractive, and then you want to do classical statistical mechanics. And all I will do is in the brand canonic list. And over here, I want you to think of systems that might be inhomogeneous. So you might want to specify not just one scalar density variable, but really a profile Rolex. Another kind of system is when your particles are no longer point-like, but instead they have an internal degree of freedom. And one such example, especially if you work in um, liquid crystals, which I think some of you know much more about than I do, um, is that perhaps you think of rods that move in space, and then you would characterize these things by a position which could be the center of the rod. 
and then an orientation which could be a unit vector. So here the unit vector would be my internal degree of freedom. And the thing I want to emphasize over here is that in this middle column, I want you to think of the internal degree of freedom as being a continuous variable, in particular uncounted. Yet another picture is some um, mixtures, or if you like, multi-species and multi-component systems. And just to have one concrete example, that's kind of my pet example, um, you could think of mixtures of hard spheres of different radii. Perhaps just to fix ideas, you, you have a countable set of admissible radii, which are such that radius RK corresponds to a ball of volume proportional to K. The motivation over here actually comes from toy models of um, condensation, where you want to think of such a sphere as a very simplified droplet made out of K particles. And then you ask is, are you going to see one large or many small? And then this is mentally somehow connected to um, the question of phase transition in a very naive and heuristic way. So this is what got me started, but um, I'm not able to say anything about this in general. Good. Now the goal for all of these three systems is to write the free energy as a function of the density profile, rho of x, or if you think of this mixture as a function of a vector of densities, where each sphere size has its own density variable, rho k. Now let's just remind ourselves um, of the key formulas. I think that most of these formulas are familiar in one way or another um, to most of you, but perhaps some of us work more in the discrete setup, so a reminder doesn't hurt. I work on the grand canonical ensemble and finite volume. Um, my input is not a scalar activity, but really an activity profile, Z of Q. There's a pair potential V. Um, I don't want to deal with inverse temperature, so beta is set equal to one. And then here's the usual grand canonical partition function. You see, if Z were constant, then you would have the usual Z to the N in front. In the case where you have a countable species index, like for the discrete set of radii, here this integral dq is supposed to be a shorthand. You do both in one go. You integrate over the position of the sphere and you sum over the size. And the log or minus the log of this thing is the lambda grand potential. Now one functional of interest, especially for people doing density functional theory and um, I learned recently that there's also such a thing as classical density functional theory, is the Helmholtz free energy. And one way to define it in the grand canonical setup is that you just take the Legendre transform of um, the logarithm of the grand canonical partition function um, with respect to the log of the activity profile. So FL of rho is the soup over all activity profile. And then you have this expression integral rho log z minus the logarithm of the partition function. Of course, if you ask for which z is the maximum over here achieved, this leads you to, leads you to the familiar equation that rho as a function of z is simply z times the derivative of the, very, of the grand canonical, the logarithm of the grand canonical partition function with respect to z. And the continuum setup, it's a variational term. Also classical formulas, if the interaction vanishes, so little v is identically zero, then z and q are just the same. And the free energy is just the integral of rho log rho minus rho. And what we're after is, well, if the interaction does not vanish, but is sufficiently weak, or the density is small, what are the power series corrections to this? Now, the power series connection, corrections are actually well known if, if you, you're happy not to ask about convergence. Namely, it is known that you can write the inverse of the Z rho relation in the following form. Z is simply rho times something. And it's something you can write as exponential of minus. And then there is a sum over certain things and uh, an integral where you have here essentially a density to the power n. 
And um, here in this integral, a kernel, which um, I will say something about in a minute. And same thing for the free energy, you have the, the ideal gas contribution integral real world growth, and then comes a correction term defined in terms of this kernel D. And it is known that these coefficients over here, so the dn as a function of q1 to q, qn, so this integrand, is simply given by a sum over two connected graphs on n vertices. So let's perhaps briefly remind ourselves of what that is. So two connected graph is a graph that is connected and it stays connected when you remove a vertex. So such a graph would be okay. Such a graph is not okay because upon removing this thing, the graph becomes disconnected. So it is a sum over all two connected graphs on n vertices and each graph contributes a weight, which is a product over all the edges of the graph. And each edge contributes the Meyer F function, which is if you have QI and QJ, then you put here this e to the minus interaction, minus one. And if you have a pair potential of compact support, you see that this thing vanishes unless QI and QJ are sufficiently closed so that the pair interaction is non zero. Now, these formulas, um, you will find them, for example, in papers by Stell or Hiroike and Morita from the 16s. It's really a classical story. The question is, however, what about convergence? So let's see what is known about this. Of course, it's an old story, so there are results in convergence. Let's just remind ourselves of some of them. Well, the simplest situation is if you have just a homogeneous translationary invariant single type system, and there's just one scalar density variable. I wrote rho larger than zero, but if you're interested in analyticity, of course, you can think of rho as a complex thing. And then there are results by Leibovitz and Penrose from 64, by Hohnefeld from 67, and um, a lot of work since then. I don't even attempt to cite uh, to do a list. Um, there's also the situation where, let's say, you have a translationally invariant system with a finitely many different types of particles. And then instead of having one scalar variable, you just have a vector. Um, so that's a mixture of finitely many things. And there also, there are results. And these is, again, we're still in the 60s. Now, motivated by this mixture of hard spheres of unbounded size, we started looking at what happens when you have countably many different types of particles. And so instead of having a vector, you really have a sequence of densities. And it turned out that if we had to work more for that than I would have initially thought, but we got a result with uh, Stephen Tate and Dimitri Zagaroyanis and Daniel Ucci, and this was a couple of years ago, but not anymore in the 60s. And we did it using um, Lagrange good inversion, for those of you who know what it is. Now, what is missing in this list is um, what if you really have a density profile which is indexed by a continuous variable that lives in an uncountable space? And this is what I want to explain now. And this we did not cover a couple of years ago. So the result is the following. Let's just add a couple of assumptions on the pair potential. So I work with a pair potential um, which might be negative, so attraction is allowed. It can have a hard form. Um, I'm assuming that it is bounded from below um, in the following form. If I ask about the interaction between x and y, then this is bounded by some function minus p star of x. The x dependence, if you like, allows um, the bound to depend on the species index in a multi-species system. And it's supposed to be stable, um, meaning that the overall energy of a system of n particles is bounded from below by minus, and then there's a sum given in terms of some non-negative function b of b of x. So if b is constant, this is just a familiar minus n times b. And then the convergence result says the following. Suppose that your density profile rho satisfies for some 
non-negative weight function A, this bound over here, so for every x, you ask that the integral over all, over the single particle configuration space of one minus e to the minus absolute value of the fair interaction. And then there's this exponential that has the lower bound b star, the stability b, and then this twice times the weight function at y, integrated out against rho, and all of that's supposed to be small or equal to a of x. Once you know that, you also know that this generating function for two connected graphs at density profile rho, which appeared on the previous slides on the expansion of the free energy and powers of rho, you can bound it by this wave function A, and it is fine in particular. So if you know Kotetsky price type conditions or continuum versions of it, which I learned from, from Daniel Urci, so a paper from 2004 and another paper by Pogosian and Urci, then this is very much like those things. There's two minor differences. So here there's the e to the minus the absolute value of the, which we get by using an improved tree graph inequality by Pocacci and Juchtman. Um, and here, instead of having an A, there's a 2A. But otherwise, it looks very much similar. And this is what makes it kind of nice because you have a kind of Kotetsky high step condition for the virial expansion. If you've never seen this condition, then chances are it looks a little bit ugly and abstract. So let's just look at one example. Suppose you have hard spheres of radius R and RD. So your interaction is just a hard core interaction. Then you see that this one minus e to the minus pair potential is just an indicator. You can make the ansatz that um, you choose a to be a constant. The b and b star is just zero because you have a non-negative pair potential. And then you find that a sufficient condition for the convergence of uh, for, for this condition to be satisfied is that the supnorm of rho times the volume of um, the sphere of radius twice two r is smaller than the soup over a, and then there's e to the minus 2a obtained by bringing this to the other side, which is something you can compute. It's 1 over 2e, and that is 0 0.18. So this horrible condition actually gives you a number. It's not that bad. So we, were, we were very happy to see that the 0 0.18 is better than the 0 0.14 that you have in Leibovitz Penrose even though radius of convergence and proving that is not especially what we were after. Um, but then we learned that it's actually worse than a criterion by Hohnefeld, so it's somewhere in the middle. But still. Now, let me give you um, a very quick proof idea. And I explain in the univariate case and ask you to believe me that it actually extends to the multivariate. The starting point is that you write the density activity relation as rho of z is equal to activity, and then comes a correction term, which is e to the minus some power series of z. This is given to you by the known activity expansion. We very much build on that. Now you make a trivial transformation and you say, well, look, if there's an inverse power series, then for sure, you just bring the e to the a to the other side. This should satisfy this fixed point equation z of rho equal to rho exponential capital A of z of rho. Now you may ask, what did I gain? It turns out you gained a lot because this thing over here determines uniquely the coefficients of the power series. You just have to solve some triangular system of equation. And then you can prove by induction for, um, uh, for the partial sums of the inverse power series with a uniquely defined coefficient that if this condition over here is satisfied, then the inverse power series actually converges. And when one gains a little bit of exercise, it's actually nice to see that there's always kind of a correspondence between a fixed point equation and an associated um, convergence condition. And this correspondence is not new. So I learned about it from, um, from a paper by Fernandez and Focacci. There's also some things in papers by Ferris. 
And the way to think about it is that you go from one to the other by kind of thinking of Z as being rho times E to the A. Bringing this Z to the other side and putting a smaller E. Now, here you're almost done. The only thing to be done is that you have to go back to what are the ANs. Remember, these are given by the activity extensions. Blend this thing with um, things that you know from Pogosian Uchi and um, the Pogacci and Juchtman, and then you're actually done. Let me add one comment about the inverse power series. It's actually not absolutely needed for the proof, but I think it makes the picture rounder. See, there was this fixed point equation. It turns out that the solution of this fixed point equation, and therefore the inverse power series, is given as a sum over enriched rooted trees. And this representation extends to our uncountable setup. Enriched means for each vertex, so not only do you have a tree, but in addition, for each vertex, you specify a set partition on the children of that vertex. I hope you can guess from the picture how this should be read. And then what happens is that your inverse series is uh, simply given as a generating function of weight of trees. Of course, here the z to the n should be a rho to the n. Sorry. And the weight of a tree, so here's an example, each set, uh, each block of a set partition of some set of children of a root contributes a factor. And remember, this was the factor which appears in the fixed point. Now, we were very happy when we understood it, but actually, um, thanks to remarks we got after talks, um, we learned that this relation is actually quite classical. So there are galavati nicolo trees and renormalization and dynamical systems. In numerics, there are equations that appear um, and that are also addressed using trees, and there the keyword is butcher trees. In algebra, there's something called the Bascon or Wright tree inversion formula. And in combinatorics and formal power series, there's something called the algorithm form of Lagrange group. So that was the main thing I wanted to say. Now, I think I have two minutes, so I want to say one more thing. Two more things. Number one is, well, as I said, theorem is a kodetsky preissler condition for density expansions. Now, when you go back to mixtures of hard spheres, you can make the equation look a little bit more concrete. And it turns out that the condition imposes exponential decay of densities in the sphere size. Namely, if it is satisfied, then necessarily the row case, they should be something like e to the minus some constant times the volume of the sphere. Now the question is, can you get rid of it? For activity expansions, you cannot. But for density expansions, I would very much like to say yes. I don't know that this is true in general, but I do have examples where this is satisfied, namely rods on a line or multi-species tongue scales and hierarchical mixture of cubes. What makes me hopeful that maybe something can be done is examples is results for binary mixtures. There's a popular model for um, colloids, which is popular in physical chemistry, but I think it's not that well known in mathematical physics. It's called the Asakura Osawa model. It is a binary mixture where you have large spheres and small spheres. And the interaction is kind of amusing. There's a slight as asymmetry, so two large spheres cannot overlap. A large sphere and a small sphere also cannot overlap. But small spheres on their own are like an ideal gas. So those can freely overlap. Now what you can do for this model is that you could say, well, let's just integrate out the small spheres and end up with an effective model for the large spheres. And then it turns out that a good definition for an effective activity is that you say effective activity of large objects should be the original activity, and then comes an exponentially small weight, which takes into account the volume excluded for the small spheres by the presence of the large sphere. And in terms of these effective parameters, you can prove that the pressure of the binary mixture is given by the pressure of the ideal gas of the small spheres on their own. 
And then comes a power series, which you can reorganize by saying that it's a series and the effective activity with um, coefficients that depend on the small activity. And for this one to converge, so absolute values come out here outside the sun, you only need that the effective activity decays with something in the surface of the large scale. And that's something I was very happy about, but now, of course, the open problem is uh, you have to go beyond binary mixtures. And there is work in progress by Anton Swan Guyen and Giuseppe Scola and Dimitris Tereroyanis to see what does this mean in terms of density variables. So that was what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sabine. Thank you very much. Um, I have a first uh, uh, online question, then I will move to the on-site ones. Um, uh, from Daniel Ulci, uh, where does the factor two in the generalized Koteski price condition comes from? Could this be improved? Ah. Well, with our proof method, I think it cannot be improved. Uh, it comes from applying tree graph inequality essentially twice. So let me find the place, yes. So the, as you see, um, number one is I treat the capital A's as a black box, and here I have a single A. Then comes number two. I remember that the capital A ends are themselves given by sums of the connected graphs, and I use a tree graph inequality, and there a second E to the A comes in. So that's very quick, but I hope it gives an idea, and I think that part we cannot get rid of. I mean, I, I don't see how. Okay, thanks. Are there uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience on site? Yes, please. So at the beginning, the setup was for uh, fugacities and density being position dependent, but then this disappeared. Do the results extend to uh, the position dependent case? Yes, I, I did not want to... to bother you with uh, the formulas in the general case. So um, let's see. So whatever you write for a single variable, you can also write um, in the uncountable setup. It just becomes a bit uglier. Let me just give one formula, for example. So here, this fixed point, e fixed point equation becomes Z of Q is equal to rho of Q. And then comes an exponential. And then you would have a sum over one, n equal 1 to infinity, 1 over n factorial integral. And now instead of just having a n, you would have a function, um, xn. And then comes z of q, which actually depends on rho, uh, no, x1, sorry. And then you move on like that. Um, oops, sorry for the handwriting. And then comes, uh, let's say, dx1, dxn. So I hope this gives an idea. So basically, yes, there's, yes, the results extend. Um, the analysis and the convergence condition extend. And also on the combinatorial level, things extend. Instead of just having trees, you end up having combinatorial species for colored things. And then you start dealing with trees where the root has a certain color and you sum over the colors of the children and you can do all kinds of nice things. I hope okay, this thank you. is an idea. Uh, are there more questions? Okay, doesn't seem so. Also from online, uh, uh, no questions online. So I think we can uh, thank uh, Sabine again. Thank, thanks again for the nice talk. Thank you. And we can proceed with the next talk uh, of this um, of this session. Um, uh, is by uh, Rafael Greenblatt. Um, uh, Rafael, uh, uh, just a small introduction. Uh, Rafael received his uh, PhD in 2010 from uh, Rutgers University under uh, with uh, Joel Leibovitz as, as advisor, and then uh, um, he um, traveled as a postdoc uh, to. Um, 
Roma 3, uh, Paris Descartes, uh, Sapienza University in Rome again, and uh, Zurich. Uh, he's now assistant professor in Trieste at CISA. Um, and Rafael is, a, is an expert of uh, several methods in uh, um, uh, equilibrium statistical mechanics uh, for uh, quantum and classical uh, uh, systems uh, with or without disorder. Um, he contributed to the uh, theory of uh, rounding of first order phase transition uh, uh, for uh, quantum systems with quench disorder. Um, and to the, um, to the theory of, uh, uh, of the critical behavior of uh, um, easing-like systems uh, with columnar the disorder. Uh, he also contributed to uh, the problem of universality of screen limit uh, in uh, certain two-dimensional critical systems, such as uh, uh, easing models with uh, non-integrable interactions uh, and dimer models in, in finite domains. And today he will present uh, um, uh, his results on non-integrable easing-like models and the constructive renormalization group. Uh, Rafael, also for you, this uh, uh, nice medal as an invited speaker. Thank you. And uh, please. So is there, um, is there uh, a remote control for the... Uh, is there... Hmm? Oh, yes. Is, is there a control for this, the screen? Thank you. So um, actually what I'm, the, the new uh, results here in what I'm going to present today, um, uh, let's, uh, okay, um, are in, are some joint work with Alessandro Giuliani and Giovanni Antinucci, which are in these, these two preprints um, here. I'm not quite managing to use the pointer correctly, but uh, I think I'll get uh, towards, oops. Um, so uh, it does it's not very important um, okay um, and so just um, let me be uh, clear well okay so first let me talk about uh, what kind of, say what kind of model I'm talking about so this is um, I invented some a new name for it which I think makes a distinction slightly clear but what I'm talking about is um, non-integrable variants of the planar easing model um, so, like with the standard easing model, you have a configuration space uh, consisting of spins which take value plus and minus one. That is, you have, you, take, you have some lattice and you assign a spin value to each site on the lattice. I'm going to specifically consider things which are at least locally look like the square lattice so that I can talk about uh, translation and variance, um, which is uh, quite important. So, I'm um, what I'm going to talk about is a class of models where one starts with the normal nearest neighbor square lattice easing model, which is the um, first term in the Hamiltonian that I've written. Um, here I've, I've um, written it with an anisotropic interaction. It's actually that we, we can do that, but it's simpler if you think about it as being isotropic. And then there's an additional term which is um, somewhat uh, generic. So the, the necessary properties are um, that it should be even under spin, spin flip. So I'm writing here a sum over some function of, of subsets, of coefficients, depending on the subset, and for each subset, the product of the values of the spins on that set of sites. So this should be restricted to um, even subsets, so that the system is still um, even under the Hamiltonian and therefore other things are still even under the flipping all spins. It should be restricted to strictly finite range and it should be translation invariant. So I'm just going to say easing model uh, to distinguish uh, the situation with just a pair interaction and then there's the planar easing model which is the standard integrable case in which here would be interactions only between nearest neighbors and of course um, I you all, I hopefully you all know what a Gibbs measure is, but uh, just to be, of course, that's what the Hamiltonian defines. Also, I'll also consider, um, uh, just restrict to things which are invariant under lattice rotations. Um, that just makes a few expressions simpler, but it's not uh, crucial. Um, okay, and um, let me mention uh, that um, uh, one observable which uh, a, 
we can say more about in our results, which involves products of spins on neighboring sites, which we call the energy observable, even though that's maybe slightly a misnomer for this modified, uh, um, modified interaction. But I'll use this symbol, this symbol epsilon, which is the product of two spins at the site labeled by X. Um, also, just one last bit of notation, I'm going to talk about uh, truncated correlation functions indicated by these uh, semicolons, um, which can be used to reconstruct the standard correlation functions, which is just the expectations of products of observables and vice versa. And these are um, uh, simpler because this, um, in, in, these are, among other things, simpler in the scaling limit because it avoids having to subtract off averages to isolate the, the long distance behavior. Um, and the uh, one last bit of notation, the, the truncated correlation functions are obtained from this, this expectation of an, an exponential, which is the generating function, and which will be, uh, which will reappear uh, somewhat. Okay, so um, why talk about these models? Um, well, um, so there, these are because of, of universality. So there are, there are a lot of things that are known about the planar easing model, which is solvable in a very strong sense, as um, we know thanks to many people, including uh, Professor Griffiths, who we <laughs> heard about yesterday, but also um, more recently, um, there are some results of the last 10 years or so that have uh, come out of people working here in Geneva, in particular about um, uh, the conformal transformation properties of the easing model. Um, so um, the, it's known for the planar case that if you look at two domains which, um, so two lattices which discretize two different continuous domains which are related by a conformal transformation, then asymptotically uh, when all of the distances in, involved are large, um, the correlation functions in one domain can be obtained from the correlation functions in the other domain by applying the conformal map or the, and uh, rescaling according to the, the local scaling induced by the conformal map with an exponent that's different for the, for the observables involved. So it's a minus one eighth for the spin and minus one for the, um, for the energy. And this corresponds, by the way, to the much older results that the spin-spin correlation goes by, it goes like distance to the minus one fourth and the energy, energy correlation goes by distance to minus one. This is um, proven in various bits. The paper I, I, I cite here is a sort of one of, of, of many that this, this considered the spin correlations, I think, in plus boundary conditions. Oh, I should say that implicitly, um, here I'm using open boundary conditions. I didn't make that explicit, but um, what, I'm, what I mean here is just ignore any terms that, ex when I have a boundary, ignore any terms that extend outside. So I have open boundary conditions defined in that sense. Um, okay, so these conformal properties, um, they're only n uh, rigorously shown for the planar easing model, but they're expected to be quite generic, really generic, that this is, this is um, that, uh, sorry, I should say this, this is, at, this is at, the, at the critical temperature, although in, in, in sort of true in a trivial sense otherwise. That is to say, there exists an inverse temperature at which this, the, um, the, um, at which the correlation functions have, among other things, this, this conformal transformation, the, this conformal property. Um, and this is, uh, that, the, that there should be some conformal formulas, I think, expected to be quite generic for two-dimensional syst uh, systems with local interactions and which are translation invariant. Um, uh, it, it, this is not something that should depend. This, there are some properties of the of the planar easing model which depend on it being integral, but, but this most definitely should not. Um, and this is part of a that is this is sometimes uh, part. Of, this is in a sense part of the statement that that the there's a universality class that there are a variety of properties which aren't changed by local modifications in the model. Um, so. Uh, let me say, there, there are, I'll mention a, a couple of results that start to go in this direction. So what seems to be the case uh, here is that the, um, for the non-integrable model, which we sometimes call the, I'm going, probably going to slip into calling the, the interacting model, which may be confusing, is that the scaling limit of the correlation function, so the long distance asymptotics, 
are the same as for the integrable model up to a change in the critical temperature um, and a rescaling of the observables, um, both of which depend on the interaction strength, although it's, I haven't been completely explicit. Um, uh, so the first uh, result that I'm aware of, although it built on um, some earlier some earlier works um, on different properties of these systems, starting with an unpublished work by Pinson and Spencer sometime, several years earlier, um, was about um, only energy, uh, okay, it was a, um, so there are several results, all of which are restricted so far, um, including the one I'm, including our new result, in terms of which observables are covered and which geometries are covered. So the um, first result uh, by uh, Sandro Giuliani, Vieri Master Pietro, and myself, we were able to show uh, this relationship for energy energy correlations on a torus, but in the limit in which the diameter of the torus is much larger than the distance between the correlation functions, so uh, the distance between the, the observables, um, so that one doesn't actually see the effects of the geometry, so that it might as well be on the plane. Um, that a previous result is in the framework uh, I set up, although we, we stated it a, a little less uh, generally, it holds for any sort of interaction of the type I've mentioned, so it could hold for, a, could be, for example, a four spin interaction, a six spin interaction, something like that. And for either sign, as long as the, the, um, the prefactor is small, where by small I mean there's some, uh, some number depending on the form and the one fixes the prefactor small enough. Um, there's a, a different result using, I should say, using entirely different techniques um, by Eisenman, Dominil Copin, uh, Tassion, and Wartzel, um, which is based on a, a random current representation which applies to um, spins on the boundary of a half plane. And there they considered only, let's say, the non-planar easing model, so only pair interactions, but not necessarily nearest neighbor. So a non-integrable uh, subset of the non-integrable case. And they're only with a fixed sign. So this is so um, strictly ferromagnetic in the somewhat more physical terminology. Whereas um, our results apply to uh, systems with a predominant ferromagnetic interaction, but not uh, completely. There can be some terms whose sign is not fixed. Um, what we've been able to, to show is um, uh, first for the, we've, uh, in the two preprints I mentioned, we show the convergence for the energy observables on a cylinder, including in a limit where the, uh, in an, the asymptotic regime where all of the distances involved are comparable. So one sees the effect of the boundary, the effect of the finite system size, and so on. Um, and this ca uh, can be generalized also to include the spins at the boundary. And since the half plane can be obtained as a certain um, limit of the cylinder, there's some overlap with the case considered by Eisenman, Dumenil, uh, Eisenman and Company. Um, that is, uh, we're working out the details. Um, so let me say um, something quite briefly about how, um, how we were able to do this, um, which I hope to say something that'll be at least in part comprehensible to people who aren't too, uh, beyond the very small number of people who are familiar in detail with the, the, with the uh, multi-scale expansion methods that we use. Um, so uh, this starts from um, uh, an understanding of the integrable planar model. Um, and one of the senses in which the, the integral model is integrable, it's very solvable, is that, for example, the energy correlations uh, have this, um, this uh, Pfaffian form, the Pfaffian for, um, people who don't know is a polynomial in the entries of, a, of an anti-symmetric matrix, which um, is related to the determinant, in particular the square of the Pfaffian is the determinant. Um, and the matrix in question is, um, uh, which we tend to call the, the propagator, but is uh, also identified with the two-point function of the katanov cheva fermions up to some linear combinations. Um, is um, the precise form the formula that I gave here is for G, um, which is the inverse of a certain weighted adjacent weighted signed adjacency uh, matrix of this this cluster graph, where each spin is replaced replaced with four uh, sites, and the energy observable 
is associated um, uh, <laughs> uh, with the two uh, the two um, the two sites at the tip of the bond that it represents. Um, so uh, that also that this is a, um, a formula that also appears in quantum field theory is fermionic the fermionic Wicks rule. It's a, basically the defining feature of a free fermionic field theory, um, and it can also the uh, Fafian as a general result can also be written in this way um, as a so-called Berezin integral in terms of Grassmann variables. This is a formal. Um, it is a, a linear uh, map from Grassmann polynomials to the, in this case, the reals, um, which generalizes an integral. In particular, the Fafian corresponds to um, a Gaussian integral in which one has an, the exponential of a quadratic form. Um, with uh, this is this is how one um, set. This is essentially how one uh, sets up path integrals for. Uh, for, for fermionic field theories, and that's where we borrowed um, quite a lot of our methods from. Um, so incidentally, the, the matrix uh, G, um, the, the fact that it's, in the in, it's defined as the inverse of another matrix also gives a representation of it as the solution of a linear boundary value problem, which will, is um, the, the basis for the whole um, s holomorphicity setup that a lot of the, 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 that the results of the, the, um, these results about conformal invariance for the integrable model are obtained from. Um, so that's also an important object in, in our uh, theory. And starting from this uh, Pfaffian formula, we can uh, write um, anything that's a, any um, observable that's a function of, the, of this energy observable in effect in terms of a uh, a Berezin integral. Um, the uh, uh, one consequence of have a very important consequence of restricting to even interactions is that I can then write that as a local sum of energy observables. So the spin at two distant sites is the product of the energy on all the bonds on a path connecting them, for example, as a sort of telescoping product. Um, and with uh, some effort, so here I'm <laughs> going to get vague again, uh, one can write the, um, the generating functional for the energy observables, or, sent using, or well, anything else that would be local in terms of these Grassmann fields, as a Berezin integral with um, a, not just a quadratic exponent, which, of course, which is what one gets for an, a mod, uh, for um, the, the partition function of interacting fermionic quantum field theories. Um, so that's the first step. Um, now to actually go beyond that and uh, do something, we need uh, some more details about the, the objects in this, uh, in this integral. Um, I do wanna mention uh, one technical point um, because it's what's, this is the, the reason that we're restricted to certain geometries is that there are certain properties of um, the propagator or fermion correlate, free fermion correlation that um, we don't know how to uh, show in complete generality. There's somewhat um, individually, perhaps innocuous things that need to be need to hold together. Okay, so the, the first one um, is more straightforward, which is that in some sense it can be you, um, it can be um, considered as a, uh, an approximation of a differentiable function of, of two quantities on each end. So, or um, this is uh, perhaps, this, that, that is, so, sorry, not so straightforward to state, but not particularly, but I assure you, not particularly mysterious. So we are going to do, as I said, um, we do a multi-scale expansion, and the first ingredient of that is to take this propagator and divide it up into, into chunks each of which have, um, you can ignore um, the, okay, so there, these are discrete derivatives. This is a bit less important, but have, but the point is that the chunks indexed by a scale h ha are um, each bounded by something that goes like two to the h, and as a function of the distance uh, exponentially decaying on a, on a distance, on a length that's uh, set, by, set by the same scale index. Um, that, of course, you could do by just 
inserting indicator functions. Um, the tricky thing, just, just indicator functions of the distance, um, the tricky thing is that we also need to um, decompose these slices into something, um, something resembling writing it as a gram matrix. We sometimes call it a gram decomposition. It's a bit more general because we're talking about an anti-symmetric matrix, but that there are a collection of vectors in, in some space such that each matrix element is an inner product. Uh, so, okay, these vectors are indexed by half of the R, each indexed by half of the argument, the, 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 the fermion or Grassmann field at one point, and the labels of the fermion or Grassmann field at the other point, um, that then the matrix elements are all given by the associated inner products of these vectors, and that the, they, um, the norms of the vectors have a similar bound to the, um, the matrix element themselves. Um, it's, it's not particularly uh, clear in general how to obtain this, so we do this. Um, we've only been able to carry this through in, in situations where we know how to more or less exactly diagonalize the, um, uh, the, the matrix S or equivalently the matrix G, the, the, um, the Castellan matrix or the free action. Um, okay, and this is uh, an important element in the estimates that we use, which I won't uh, express in detail. Um, so, just very um, what <laughs> the, the, there's a lot of moving parts in the proof. <clears throat> so, but um, for those of you, uh, those of you who for whom this this means something. The uh, correlation functions um, can be expressed in terms of um, essentially um, a, sum over, a sum over Feynman diagrams with some modifications that correspond to, um, uh, that are necessary to cancel um, uh, divergent terms. Um, I won't attempt to explain this in uh, too much, in really any detail, except to note that it's possible to identify um, uh, certain, uh, it, it, this is in the very much, this is a, a form of the constructive normalization group. It's possible to identify certain contributions which are potentially uh, divergent uh, associated with a, with a scaling dimension. Um, for this theory can be written um, in this way and you have in principle three, uh, one um, a relevant uh, term, which is one, which is to say, or one, yeah, one relevant case, which is to say, definitely causing divergence, and two marginal cases, which is to say that one should needs to to be careful about them. Um, one of them is zero by reasons of a, a certain symmetry of the easing model, and one can can, can um, deal with the other two by um, introducing um, a counter term that is adding, subtracting something fixed appropriately. I'm, that, is, that probably means nothing to people who haven't um, waded through some of these papers, but I, I apologize. The, um, the, key in, um, the key difference of the cylinder compared to the, the torus that we um, had to deal with besides the, the exact diagonalization being different is that now um, we have a situation, a uh, system which is not strictly translation invariant. Um, but only uh, translation invariant in the, in the infinite volume limit, or if you like, locally translation invariant. We have boundaries. Um, and the key to, to dealing with that is that it's possible to, in the multiscale multi expansion, one can separate um, a geometry independent contribution defined by the infinite volume limit and finite size corrections, and one can break those down into finite size corrections in the various elements of the graphs, which we regroup into galavadi nicolo trees, something which was mentioned in the previous talk. The finite size corrections always, um, if for various reasons, end up involving um, a decay either in the distance to the boundary or in the diameter of the periodic direction. That is the distance you have to travel in order to see um, with what the system size is, the distance you have to travel in order to see that you're not on the plane. Um, 
and it's possible to use that to um, carry out sums over positions in the Feynman diagrams in a more advantageous way, which, oops, sorry, um, ends up uh, improving the scaling dimension by one for the finite sized terms. That leaves just one kind of uh, potentially marginal term, um, which it turns out to have, which turns out to have no local part um, due to the boundary conditions of the free fermionic field, which uh, one component of which ends up vanishing um, at each boundary. So that's um, very brief, um, but those are the those are the essential things. So um, there is still a lot left to do. Um, as uh, I implied, we'd like to be able to consider uh, more general more general domains, since none of the um, cases that I've talked about so far actually involve non-trivial conformal mappings, apart from uh, simply rescaling. And as I said, mentioned, the, the, the difficulty, I mentioned the difficulty there, this obtaining this decomposition uh, for the, for the two-point free fermion correlation. Um, spin correlation functions, um, aside from uh, at the boundary, um, are, um, are difficult because they don't have a local, a straightforward local representation in terms of the Grassmann variables. Um, but they can be considered, and this is similar to actually the, um, the uh, part of, this is an important part of the techniques that were used for the integral case, they can be considered as um, uh, deformations in the geometry in which the, the, the Fermi field lives, which, um, so that one has a, a correlation functions which change sign when one of the, uh, one of the arguments winds around the spin. Uh, similar to the, as one would expect from the katanov cheva fermions. So this is also, this is another question, really, of being able to treat more general geometries, just a very specific one. Um, and I should also mention that um, one can tell a similar story about the Dimer model, in which, which is another in integrable model, which is actually closely related to the Easing model, as it's come to be appreciated more and more over the years. Um, but the interaction um, that one would naturally add, which is simply to reweight the configuration, uh, to, to add a weight which depends on local configurations, so simply add an interaction between the dimers, um, has uh, quite a different effect. And the, the, the outcome is not that the scaling limit is the same as the integral model, um, but in fact has a, a quite non-trivial dependence on the uh, at least the, well, it con depends continuously on the strength of the interaction. So it's also expected there th that the, the, um, the scaling limit should be conformally invariant. Um, but proving conformally invariance is more complicated than just proving the scaling limit is the same as some, no some other known object. One has to actually uh, carry out um, an analysis of the, of the, of the corrections uh, in more detail. Be um, Although, on the other hand, for the Dimer model, there are at least some geometries where uh, the, there is a more natural way of doing the decomposition that I'm, that I'm talking about. So I'm not sure which, which order to expect, uh, uh, which order I expect uh, progress in, in these three things. And um, there, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Rafael. Uh, so are the questions uh, from the on-site audience? Yes? Uh, so Rafael, thanks for the presentation. So if I understand then, the result also extends to spin-spin correlations on the boundary. I mean, you presented uh, a statement about energy-energy correlations, but you also mentioned something about spin-spin correlation. I mean, I just wanted to know whether this applied, the technique applied directly to that case or one has to work a bit more. Um, it's not, it's, uh, it's, it's a not terrible, it's not much more, it's not much of an added complication. It's the, the there's, um, the, if you have, the spin is on the boundary, um, then specifically when you have spins on the boundary, there's a local representation in terms of the fermion fields. So it's, it's not the same as the energy function, but it's not any more complicated. 
more questions? Okay, uh, I, I have one. So can you um, uh, comment a, a little bit more about what you said uh, at the end? I mean, uh, about uh, um, the fact that for Daimler models where you have uh, uh, a representation in terms of uh, of the propagator in terms of uh, discrete Laplacian on a, on a graph, uh, whether this allows you to 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 define a multi-scale decomposition in a more flexible or, uh, way. Right. So, so what I was alluding to, um, which I think Alessandro is also referring to some things that I, I mentioned to him uh, previously, is that. Um, so it, um, one thing that I think is, is reasonably well known is that the, um, the free correlation functions are, are harmonic functions. And in fact, um, uh, one can calculate them from the, the Green's function of the discrete Laplacian. In fact, in a dimer model, this is a bit uh, simpler because if you take the, the matrix, um, the Castellan matrix, um, if in a certain uh, setup, if you take the, the the Castellan matrix times its transpose, you obtain a, a um, discrete Laplacian on a subgraph um, up to potential complications with the boundary. And so it's possible to write the inverse of the Castellan matrix in terms of the inverse of the Laplacian, which is to say the Green's function. Um, the Green's function is the expected number of visits of a random walk to a certain site. Um, total all, over all time. You can integrate that over the probability over time. You, you can get that by integrating over time the probability that it's there at any particular time, uh, which is to say the heat kernel. And then the inverse Castellan matrix is, is associated to that by taking what to, is equivalent to a discrete derivative. Now, this, the heat kernel has a structure um, which um, you can match the, if you just cut the heat kernel in half, consider the, the heat kernel for T over two and T over two. Um, that has the kind of decomposition that we need. And it, it sh okay, and, and, bo and bounds that one expects the heat kernel to satisfy, um, you know, uh, so this is in two dimensions, so that it goes like one over T, e to the minus distance squared over T, and the gradient go should go like um, one over T to the three halves times the, times the Gaussian, would imply the bounds that we need. There, the, um, the up to the boundary thing is complicated. There are some, uh, so that, that restricts which uh, domains one can consider, and also not all of those uh, heat kernel bounds are proven, I think. Okay. But it's some place to start. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think we, we should proceed. Uh, let's thank uh, Raphael again. <laughs> And the uh, next speaker I have the pleasure to introduce is uh, Roland Bauerschmidt, uh, who um, uh, will uh, make his presentation uh, uh, online. Hi, hello, Roland. Um, so um, uh, before Roland starts his presentation, let me briefly introduce him. Uh, so Roland Bauerschmidt obtained his uh, PhD uh, in 2013 at the University of British Columbia uh, with David Bridges and Gordon Slade. After that, he was postdoc uh, um, at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and then at uh, Harvard University. And now he's a reader at the Statistical uh, Laboratory in uh, uh, Cambridge, UK, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, Roland is uh, uh, an expert of uh, uh, probability theory analysis, uh, uh, mathematical physics, and applications to uh, several uh, statistical mechanics and quantum field theory uh, models. Uh, he obtained uh, remarkable results uh, on uh, um, the, the critical behavior of uh, 544 models uh, uh, via uh, constructive renormalization group methods uh, um, and uh, on uh, critical behavior of the weekly self avoiding walk in four dimensions as well. Um, he also studied and obtained uh, uh, important results on the eigenvalue statistics uh, in uh, um, random regular graphs. Uh, and uh, he studied uh, um, the mass generation problem in, in, uh, in sine Gordon quantum field theory, which I think uh, will tell us something about uh, today. Uh, and uh, he also studied the st stochastic din dynamics of uh, uh, several statistical mechanics and quantum field theory models. 
And uh, uh, so I'm very happy that uh, today you will uh, uh, tell us about uh, probabilistic aspects uh, of the um, uh, sine Gordon field theory. Ah, and uh, also for you, Roland, uh, so there is this uh, nice medal uh, that uh, as an invited speaker you will uh, receive soon. Okay, please, you can start. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Um, let me pol apologize in advance for my voice. I've been uh, ill the past few days. Uh, I hope I'll, I'll make it through the talk. Um, uh, okay, so uh, I, I will uh, report on um, uh, basically three joint works with uh, Thierry Baudineau, uh, my PhD student, Michael Hofstetter, and uh, with Christian Webb. And um, I'll focus on two of these in, in view of the, of the time. Uh, but let me uh, first, uh, so all, all of these are related to actually somewhat different aspects of, of the sine gordon theory. Um, so let me first uh, recall what that is. Um, so uh, everything, uh, I will think of the sine gordon theory just as a random field. So I, I'm, I will not discuss aspects of, of quantum field theory uh, uh, in this talk. Uh, I'd be interested in the sine gordon field uh, phi as, as a model of a random field with some interaction. And, uh, and, and the interaction is this uh, periodic potential. So, so we have the usual uh, 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 free field term where this Laplacian epsilon is, is just the uh, discretized Laplacian on a, on a lattice of uh, mesh size epsilon. Uh, we potentially allow a, a mass term, which I would uh, call a, a bare mass. Um, um, many, many questions are most interesting in the case where this mass goes to zero, but uh, for the moment, let me allow this uh, bare mass term. Uh, and then, of course, there is the periodic interaction. Um, and um, so I have been uh, deliberately imprecise about the boundary conditions. Um, uh, they actually are somewhat important, um, but they will not play a very important role in, in, in my talk. Um, so um, we will consider, um, you, you may consider uh, two important cases where everything is on a, on a large torus, say, uh, another uh, important boundary condition is, uh, uh, which I would call free boundary condition, uh, where the free field, um, or the quadratic terms, are defined directly in infinite volume, while the interaction is restricted to a finite volume. Um, and, and there's other boundary conditions that have been studied and, um, and are somewhat important. But uh, let me not, not um, say too much about this. Now, from a mathematical physics perspective, uh, the first question to um, ask about this model is, uh, does it make sense? Uh, by which I mean, uh, does it um, converge as epsilon goes to zero? And this is a question that has been studied in, in a number of works uh, in the uh, constructive uh, field theory um, uh, days. Um, uh, I, I highlighted a few names here, um, um, uh, as you can see on the slide. Maybe I, I want to distinguish between two cases, um, just, just very, very, so this I'm basically presenting for background, and I'm not going to need this uh, a whole lot later, but let, let me maybe say that for beta less than 4 pi, I think it's fair to say that the construction problem is completely understood. Um, uh, basically due to the work of uh, Frelick, and um, also uh, correlation inequalities are quite effective in this regime and uh, al allow um, to a large degree construction of, of an infinite volume theory and so on. Uh, for beta less than 8 pi, um, the picture is somewhat less complete. Um, there also exist results applying all the way up to 8 pi um, uh, that uh, uh, prove the ultraviolet stability of, of the model in, in finite volume. Um, 
but uh, especially uh, questions such as boundary conditions, the size of the allowed couplings, and so on, uh, pose uh, uh, much more difficulties here. And um, um, okay, so 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 th that is um, so much for the uh, background on on the. Um, on, on the existence of, of the model and, and, and what has been studied. Uh, in summary, I think it is fair to say that it's one of the models where the um, uh, construction is, is, uh, is uh, uh, best understood. And in fact, this will, uh, so, and, and I, I come back to this, um, there's a variety of, of approaches um, uh, to, um, to, to study the ultraviolet stability of this problem. And, uh, in particular, um, the renormalization group approach is, is, uh, is very easy to um, uh, make rigorous in, in this um, um, setting, especially when beta is less than uh, 6 pi, say. Uh, and uh, it thus provides a, a very good test case for, um, um, for questions that, that we would like to understand in much more complicated models but for which, we, uh, for which the sine gordon model, uh, due to the simplicity of the construction there, is, is, uh, is a good test case. Okay, so this, this is one aspect. A, a second, a second uh, aspect is, of course, the study of the um, physically um, interesting limit where... Um, in the infinite volume limit, uh, where the mass goes to zero, uh, the so-called uh, massless sine Gordon model, um, and in, in this regime, um, overall, uh, uh, much remains to be understood. I, I think it is fair to say. Um, uh, some uh, results that uh, can be highlighted or that that do exist uh, is uh, work of. Um, of Yang, following uh, the uh, three-dimensional bridges federbush results. Um, um, this result um, is, uh, applies to uh, beta small, um, and it obtains uh, exponential correlation decay in, in, in a certain regime. But I think it's uh, fair to say that even this result is, uh, is incomplete in the sense that uh, uh, there is a, a lot of questions remain, boundary conditions, coupling constants, and so on. Uh, okay. On the, on the other hand, um, um, the regime of the massless sine Gordon model is, is the one that is um, of, of, of interest uh, or is, is most interesting physically. Uh, there, there's a very precise picture of um, how, how this model uh, should behave. Um, it was uh, observed by Coleman that uh, formally this model is, is equivalent uh, to the massive tearing model. And subsequently, and in, in a number of uh, works um, by various authors um, uh, 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 culminating in, in the works of the Zamolodzikovs and co-authors, um, where it was observed that uh, the model is, is integrable in, 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 in various ways uh, for all, all, all values of, of beta. Um, so all of this is essentially, um, um, uh, that there, re there remain significant difficulties to, to uh, make these rigorous. And uh, in particular, they're related to the infinite volume uh, uh, limit uh, for which we, as I mentioned, uh, still uh, understand little. Um, so I, in, in view of, so in this talk, I, I will not focus on this aspect. Um, so initially I thought I, I, um, I would cover both aspects, but in, ultimately there's a limited amount of time and I, I cannot uh, say everything. And um, I, I would just want to mention that uh, so in, in this respect, uh, the simplest possible case, which is the so-called free fermion point, something that uh, Christian Webb and I revisited, um, and uh, our main contribution is how to take the infinite volume limit and show the existence of a mass in this case. 
and um, there's a, a recording of, uh, of, uh, of a talk about this in the IAMP seminar, and I, I will um, refer to that for this and instead focus on, on, on the second point I mentioned, uh, which is um, uh, that I, I think the Sine-Gordon uh, theory is, 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 a, is a good uh, test case to, um, to test uh, some um, uh, global questions in the statistical field theory. So these, these global questions are, are perhaps not the ones that are most relevant for the Sine-Gordon theory. We, we, there, there are other models for which we uh, perhaps love to understand these, these more. Um, uh, but, but those are hard questions, and uh, the Sine-Gordon model provides a, a case where we can do something uh, and uh, develop methods. So, so what do I mean by global properties? By global properties, I mean ones that are not easily expressible in terms of local correlation functions. So one example would be to consider um, the Glauber dynamics of the field, uh, so where the field evolves uh, according to uh, uh, um, a differential equation with uh, some uh, stochastic noise. Um, so for the sine gordon model, that would correspond to an SPDE um, that's written here, but uh, uh, never mind, this, uh, the, the form of this equation is not important for what I'm going to say. But so this, this kind of Glauber dynamics are the kinds of SPDEs that have been studied uh, by uh, Hira and co-authors in the last years. And um, uh, the sine gordon model may not be the one uh, for which uh, the uh, relaxation property of Glauber dynamics is the most interesting question. But in general, I think it's a quite interesting question. And, and this prov it provides a model where, where, as I'll explain, we can do something. Another question uh, one could uh, look at, uh, which relates to global properties, is um, the extremal behavior of the field. So for example, what happened, how does the maximum of the field over, say, a large uh, uh, collection of points behave? Um, so again, this is a question that is uh, motivated, um, uh, not, not for this model, but it, it comes uh, from uh, the study of easing interfaces where um, uh, where, say, uh, you, um, <coughs> where it is of some interest to, to understand how, how the maximum behaves. And it's a problem which has received a lot of attention in the probability um, uh, community in the last years, in particular, has been studied to extreme um, uh, precision in the case of Gaussian fields, uh, but not very much to non-Gaussian fields, uh, let alone the ones... Um, uh, say, uh, uh, discrete Gaussian or solid on solid model where, where this model would be the most interesting one. But um, um, in the case of this uh, sine gordon model, um, 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 we'll, we'll be able to say something. And uh, I will start with the, with the Glauber dynamic, or I will start with something um, previously. So the basic... Um, uh, motivation is we want a renormalization group perspective on these types of uh, global problems. And um, what has turned out to be particularly useful is um, uh, to uh, interpret the renormalization group uh, in continuous time or in continuous scale uh, as, uh, as proposed by Polchinski. So in this slide, everything is completely general. There's nothing um, uh, relating to the sine gordon model in particular, if we consider a measure nu, which has, uh, is of the general form of the measures we're interested in, has a, a Gaussian part um, uh, and an interaction part, um, uh, then we can, uh, in, 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 the pre in the situation where we have uh, all cutoffs, we can always uh, do this. We can uh, always... Um, um, decompose the Gaussian measure, for example, using the heat kernel decomposition, but other decompositions would be, uh, um, would be possible. So we write the, the covariance of the Gaussian measure as the integral over the heat kernel. And uh, this gives a regularized covariance and uh, we'll, uh, we, we can define Gaussian measures uh, corresponding to these. And uh, then by convolving um, this, um, regularized Gaussian measure with the, uh, 
with the exponential of the potential, we can define the renormalized potential as, as, uh, <coughs> as usually. So e to the minus vt is the convolution of the uh, Gaussian measure with covariance ct with e to the minus v naught. And so if you do this continuously, um, this renormalized potential vt solves uh, the Polchinski equation which is the equation I, I wrote uh, on, on this slide. So it's the it's, uh, Hamilton Jacobi type PDE. Uh, it's a very high dimensional, of course. V is a, a potential that depends on the field. Uh, the field uh, is a function of, of all lattice points. We're imposing, say, cutoffs in the infrared and the ultraviolet, so there's finitely many, but um, uh, ultimately uh, infinite. Uh, many uh, and uh, um, and um, uh, the renormalized potential satisfies this beautiful equation. As beautiful as this equation is, in, in practice, uh, it has been of uh, uh, let's say bounded use uh, in um, uh, the theory of the renormalization group because it's very hard to solve this equation. Um, and in practice. Um, uh, the renormalization group proceeds in discrete steps. Um, but uh, in the case of the sine gordon model, um, the Polchinski equation is not hard to solve. Uh, and, and that is one of the beauties. And uh, uh, there's a beautiful paper of Bridges and Kennedy where they, uh, where they do this. It's also related to the iterated Meyer expansion uh, considered by various other people uh, before. Um, um, uh, essentially, this is a continuous iteration, uh, if, if you prefer. And um, so, in, so the sine Gordon model provides an example. So the ultraviolet problem of the sine Gordon model provides an example where we can solve the Polchinski equation, and we can explore some of uh, some of uh, its consequences. And um, um, so, and so here is one. So again, this, this result is, uh, is stated very generally for a measure e to the minus uh, so, uh, a half phi, uh, for, for a measure with a Gaussian part and a potential v naught. Um, we defined the renormalized potential vt as before. And then in this uh, theorem with uh, Thierry Boudinot, what we proved is that if you can control the Hessian of the renormalized potential, uh, in a certain way. It looks somewhat complicated, but the, the condition is not, not, not too complicated. Uh, then this implies the Luxembourg inequality for the measure. And um, now, um, so um, let me pause for a second. So, um, it, so, so this is a result. Uh, so, there, uh, so this is maybe a little bit out of from um, most people's uh, background here, but um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a very uh, b rich uh, theory of, uh, of Lux Sobolev inequalities and so on under the assumption of convexity. Of course, convexity is, is not is, is useless in our context. The measures we're interested in are not convex. Um, and uh, what our theorem essentially does, it, it generalizes this theory of uh, bakri emri uh, to uh, apply to non-convex measures. And the way we do this is, uh, so this bakri emri argument, it, it uses uh, as an input interpolation according to a, a certain semigroup. And that semigroup is basically the Glaubar semigroup. And what we do is we use uh, the same type of argument, but we interpolate using the renormalization group uh, as the semigroup. So, it has to be continuous for these arguments to work. So, so for that reason, it's important that, uh, that, uh, that we have this control over the Polchinski equation. Uh, but, but basically, we use that to interpolate the relative entropy and uh, thus obtain this criterion for, for the Luxembourg inequality. Now, as stated here, it's a very abstract criterion. But this is where the sine gordon model comes in uh, to perhaps convince you that it's not a, a trivial uh, a condition. What we can do is, uh, so what it implies uh, basically is that at least when beta is less than six pi, 
the massive sine Gordon model satisfies a Luxembourg life inequality that's uniform in epsilon. And if the coupling constant is small, it's also uniform in the volume. Um, and so in particular, Glauber dynamics relaxes exponentially fast. This is uh, sort of the content of the Luxembourg life inequality. Um, so this is a result we'd love to establish in other models, uh, say uh, solid ensemble type, type models, et cetera. Um, it's, it's, it's of course much harder. Um, and, um, but we think that this condition that we derived here and for which the, that, the look, that the sine Gordon model proved uh, to be uh, a test case and sort of uh, in, a, in a situation with real geometry and a real lattice uh, is also, uh, would, uh, should also apply in other cases. We tested this in hierarchical models where we can check the condition uh, for quite a lot of models. Um, uh, but in general, um, this control on the renormalized potential is something that, of course, goes beyond what, um, what's typically done in renormalization group theory. It requires a much stronger control on large fields uh, in some sense. And um, uh, I think, well, for me anyway, this is, uh, is, a, is a very interesting challenge how to uh, get such a kind of control. Um, okay, so this, this is one... Um, uh, result I uh, wanted to present. In the last four minutes, uh, let me also show you another application of, uh, of this, which is that you can construct the field uh, as a solution to the following backwards SDE. This may uh, uh, don't be, um, let, let me not scare you with those words. Um, um, basically what it means is Given a decomposition of the covariance, we can uh, define or we can uh, write a formula for the free field as a stochastic integral, uh, which is the second, uh, second formula on the slide. So it, it gives a free field for every uh, regularization parameter t, all defined on the same probability space as a stochastic integral. And then you can solve a stochastic differential equation that involves the uh, renormalized potential to construct the sine Gordon field itself. Um, I think this is an interesting uh, um, construction of the field. So it's a construction in terms of um, um, this uh, SDE um, um, involving the decomposed free field and the renormalized potential, uh, both on the same, all on the same probability space. So in particular, the free field is constructed on the same probability space as the sine Gordon field. <coughs> so in probabilistic terms, what we have is a coupling of the two fields. And um, again, this, this allows to, uh, so having coupled these two fields uh, allows to um, uh, study uh, questions uh, uh, that otherwise uh, we'd have no idea how to do the, that. Um, so this is a work that um, uh, in particular, my PhD student, Michael Hofstetter, um, uh, worked <coughs> out, which is that uh, you can uh, look at the regularized uh, sine Gordon uh, field on a mesh of lattice epsilon and take the maximum over, uh, um, over, over an ex extensive uh, region, uh, or say a torus, um, uh, and the limit, the field is not a smooth field, so this maximum will diverge, and one can characterize in exactly which way it will diverge and uh, converges to what's called a randomly shifted Gumbel distribution, um, uh, which is something I, I'm not going to uh, go into here. And, um, um, but uh, let me close uh, this talk by, by summarizing that um, the long distance behavior of the sine Gordon theory uh, leaves a lot of interesting challenges and we've only considered the free fermion point so far and uh, but uh, this is something that I think remains very interesting and uh, uh, boundary conditions play a, a, an important role in, to understand better and make progress here I think um, something we're thinking about and uh, and uh, the second point, and this is where I spent most of this talk on, is that the small scale theory of the sine Gordon uh, field has, has a simple renormalization group th treatment and thus provides a good test case for some questions uh, like the Luxubolev inequality that, um, uh, it, that, that are hard and for which we don't have any other examples where we could 
uh, uh, where we can do this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. Are there questions? Yes, please. Um, I have a question concerning the Transparency 14, where you uh, post the stated the corollary. So, one thing is, um, can you relate the situation to uh, you study to a high or low temperature uh, limits and uh, statistical mechanics? And uh, question B, for log Sobolev inequalities, typically the boundary can and the, some uniformity in the boundary condition is is crucial um, to to have. And you said in the beginning you you sort of ignore the boundary conditions. Is is this? Uh, I mean, how do they go, uh, enter uh, this corollary? Uh, yes, uh, so here I, I've been a little bit imprecise. So this is for the sine Gordon model on a torus. Uh, so this is uh, on a torus, uh, so, uh, which in this case is the friendliest case uh, in terms of boundary conditions. Um, but uh, maybe to comment, uh, I mean, so our approach to the look, so, so you mentioned the, the sensitivity to boundary conditions and Luxembourg inequalities. And so the, the point I maybe I, I, I didn't highlight very much, but somehow our, our approach to the Luxembourg inequality to, um, to interpolate through the renormalization group differs from what's basically done everywhere in the literature, which is through uh, boxes or through, through boundaries where you need very uniform control. Uh, and uh, so I, I think this, this interpolation through um, Sort of in, in, in through the scale is is is, uh, is much friendlier in terms of uh, um, the type of um, okay uh, the the control you need. Uh, then the second question you had is how does this relate to um, um, uh, high or low temperature limits? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure how to answer this question. I mean here we. We considered this, uh, so, so this is the massive sine Gordon model, which we, I mean, it's a high temperature model, it, but it's defined with, uh, on, a, on, a mesh, on a lattice of mesh epsilon, so it's sort of strongly correlated at, at small scales. And, um, um, uh, okay, I, 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 didn't, I, I don't quite understand. Maybe we can talk uh, afterwards. I, I, I didn't quite follow the, the exact question. Um, yes. Uh, maybe you can repeat or. <coughs> uh, I, I, Roland, I, I was wondering uh, about this uh, coupling you mentioned uh, at the end of your talk um, yes. between the GFF and the sine Gordon field. Uh, do you think yes. there is an analog of this result in the ultraviolet case, in which case you would couple a, a GFF with a sine Gordon field in a continuum box, and in, in which case it would maybe shed some light on, a, on the SPD side about the works of uh, Shen and Eirer, uh, which would... So, I mean, this is on the ultraviolet side. Um, did I... Oh, did that you... slide is about the ultraviolet. Yes, it, it is. Okay. So okay. this is in the continuum. So you have a continuum GFF and a continuum sine Gordon field, and you can couple the two on the same space. Um, ah, okay, great. So and, and so so good. So so I remembered in uh, Shen and Eirer, if you are be between uh, four pi and six pi, yeah. what you need to add to the Gaussian free field is something which is uh, irregular enough so that it's not. Uh, absolutely continuous with respect to it. Yeah, so basically you can see, so you can look, so basically what it tells you is if you take the difference of the free field and the sine Gordon field, it's given by this integral over this, um, this uh, gradient of the effective potential. And uh, we, so this is a function on, on space still, it's not apparent in this notation, but the gradient is, has a space variable. And this term is, uh, is uh, C1, or is, is uh, 
differentiable for beta less than four pi, but it's only Hölder continuous once beta exceeds uh, four pi. So it has a Hölder exponent, which I think is beta over uh, four pi minus one or something like that. Um, anyway, you can compute exactly how regular this function is and it, it loses uh, a regularity as, as beta increases. Okay, thanks so, like you, you can see, so, it, so you can see how the, the Hölder regularity, it, it just comes, so for every S, this effective potential is, is smooth, but once you integrate it up, you see the, the regularity of the field. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's time for one last question. Okay, uh, I have one. Um, uh, again, <coughs> on this uh, corollary um, uh, about uh, of the um, yes, on the on the uh, on the exponential relaxation. Uh, uh, two questions. One, uh, can you say anything about the uh, massless case at beta equal four pi. I mean the the one uh, for which you you. No, I um, no for this and this for this result we cannot. And I agree it would be very interesting, but um, um, so far we cannot. Okay, but is it a technical problem or there is a, a conceptual well um, obstacle. Um, It's um, so. What, what do you expect? I think I it's. Mean, a, do you, do I you think expect it's also exponential relax. Do you expect exponential relaxation in that case as well? Uh, yes, I mean I, we do, um, but um, um, I, I think we all. Yes, we we do, but we we cannot. Um, uh, okay, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, somehow the information of the correlations, uh, so at 4 pi, we, we know we can compute all correlation functions exactly. Still, uh, it's hard to um, convert this into uh, a statement about the Glauber dynamics. You might compare this to the Ising model, say critical 2D Ising model, all energy correlations are, well, you, you know what they are. Still, it's hard to uh, 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 hard to say anything about the global dynamics of the two-dimensional Ising model, right? Yeah, but this is massive. The, the so you, you right you have a mass, so this <laughs> may think. So. Um, yes, but I, I think I mean so for the Ising model, you can ask the same on a box with a of a certain length. Uh, you have an effective mass then. Okay. Uh, yes. And, and so I I mean I. I agree it, sh it should be true and uh, it's something we've thought about, but it, it's not so easy to um, use the equilibrium information on correlations to say something about dynamics. Um, um, and partly this, um, yeah. And, and for the massive case, uh, do you expect uh, the, the, the result to hold up to eight pi? I mean, modulo, I mean, adding the- I, I think so, but uh, technically it gets harder. Um, and um, I think we I think we do expect it to hold up to eight pi, um, but uh, uh, it uh, basically is. Uh, I think it's related to this uh, conjecture of uh, Ben Fatto uh, on the uh, convergence of the Meyer expansion with the first n terms removed um, um, up to eight pi, which uh, remains open. Uh, or maybe this I, I don't know if this conjecture is due. Ben Fatto, but at least he states it. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe, I, may, maybe someone else has uh, conjectured it before. But so this conjecture, uh, I, I think, um, uh, sort of related to that, um, uh, assuming that it probably is valid up to 8 pi, but um, I have to think about it. OK, thanks. Uh, so let's thank uh, Roland again. And thanks uh, to all the speakers of this session and to the, the audience who attended the, the, section, the session. There will be a, a contributed talk session on equilibrium statistical mechanics tomorrow and the second part of invited talks uh, on Friday.